Good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with the frightening truth about where we are headed post row as the public outright continues to grow and as protests intensify. Over the weekend, abortion rights protesters demonstrated outside the homes of Justice Brett Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts, which even some Democrats joined right wingers in criticizing. I mean, I suppose if the justices don't like the First Amendment, they could just drive to another state where the legislature has determined that the constitutional right to privacy applies, right? I mean, that is what they're telling women to do if they want to control their own bodies, right? But I digress. Tonight, I would like to draw your attention to a rather telling footnote in Justice Samuel Alito's treatise on stripping the rights of half our population by overturning Roe, which caught a, a bit of online, online attention this weekend. Now, in, in this footnote, Alito cites a CDC report from 2008, and it notes, quote, nearly one million women were seeking to adopt children in 2002, whereas the domestic supply of infants relinquished at birth or within the first month of life and available to be adopted had become virtually non-existent, unquote. The domestic supply of infants. Hmm. Well, that line caught some diligent Twittersons as weird, kind of creepy. But in fact, Alito's citation backs up an argument that was pushed by fellow religious ultra-conservative Justice Amy Coney Barrett during her questioning in the Dobbs v. Mississippi case last December. After Barrett noted that both Roe and Casey emphasized the burdens of parenting and focuses on the consequences of parenting and obligations of motherhood, she asked, why don't the safe haven laws take care of that problem? Safe haven laws, of course, refer to laws in several states that allow people to drop off infants that they don't want at firehouses and police stations and other safe locations without legal consequences, like being charged with abandonment. It is, in short, the forced birth adoption option. And there is a long history of the Christian right seeking to do that, to make abortion illegal, but to push women who don't want to be pregnant to stay pregnant anyway and give the resulting infant up for adoption. Long history of that. And of pushing evangelicals to have big families and to adopt en masse. Take the Betsy DeVos-funded Bethany Christian Services, scrutinized for allegedly trying to resettle migrant children who arrived in the U.S. unaccompanied or who were stolen from their parents by the Trump administration's child separation policy to put them into Christian adoptive homes, something the organization vehemently denied. Less in doubt, the recent case in March of this year of Matt Shea, a far-right former Washington state representative who was accused of domestic terrorism in relation to allegedly helping to plan the 2016 Bundy Ranch standoff with the federal government in the state of Nevada. Remember that? Well, he was in Poland in March trying to secure adoptions for more than 60 Ukrainian children that he arrived, from, arrived with from across the border. Now, of course, shutting down Roe would increase the number of domestic available children, overlooking the fact that Using women against their will as incubators for adoptive families is literally the basis of The Handmaid's Tale. There's also Alito's other fixation on what was and wasn't legal during the 19th century. He notes that by the time the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, three quarters of states had made abortion a crime. And in yet another footnote, he writes in relation to Massachusetts's now defunct 1845 law, Case law, he said, held that abortion was allowed when, according to the judgment of physicians in the relevant community, the procedure was necessary to preserve the woman's life or, or her physical or emotional health. Now, it is telling that Alito notes the timing of the 14th Amendment, because when citing the legality of abortion for the physical and emotional health of women, that, well, that could only have meant certain women. Because in 1845, enslaved women had no protection under law and were not treated as citizens or really even as people. It was indeed the 14th Amendment that granted, at least on paper, citizenship and rights to the formerly enslaved, women for whom the reality of abortion had a very different significance in bondage. The College of Charleston notes that enslaved women knew that enslavers valued and depended upon their ability to bear children and to increase the slave population. With this understanding, enslaved women participated in acts of resistance specific to the labor demanded of them, from avoiding sexual intercourse to terminating pregnancy to taking the lives of their own infants. That includes the very real tragedy of Margaret Garner, who took the life of her own daughter rather than subject her to the horrors of slavery. That, slavery is the in that story is the inspiration behind Toni Morrison's Beloved, which goes a long way toward explaining this big push to ban that book in schools and libraries. And as the ACLU points out, just like slavery, maximizing wealth and consolidating power motivated the anti-abortion 
enterprise. Republican politicians, meanwhile, are making clear that they are not finished trying to consolidate power by not just simply overturning Roe. They're making clear that they would like to go further. And Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves evaded all sorts of questions this weekend while refusing to rule out banning contraception. While Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said a national abortion ban would be possible, would be possible if Roe is overturned. Joining me now is Anthea Butler, chair of the Religious Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania and author of White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America, and former RNC chair Michael Steele, who is an MSNBC political analyst. Thank you both for being here. Anthea, I do want to start with you. Because I went into a very deep wormhole about the history of enslaved women and abortion over the weekend. And the reality is it was an act of resistance and it was also an act of desperation for a lot of women who would take roots, things that were passed down to them, their knowledge from um, the, 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 you know, from the continent, from Africa, that their you know, mothers and foremothers knew about certain herbs you could take to abort. And they did it because slavery was worse than death. And I know that the anti-education Republicans would like to sort of portray slavery as this benign institution that wasn't so bad. The people would would rather die, would rather have their children die, and would abort on their own to stop creating more product, more available domestic supply of children. What do you make of this fixation that Samuel Alito has with that era, but in his mind, that 19th century era was the good old days? Well, for Samuel Alito, I'm pretty sure that he would like to be able to sell babies again if he possibly could. But let's let's take it back for a minute and talk about the 19th century, because I think this is really important to part of what's going on. This idea about family and the way that family gets constructed for evangelicals really starts in the 19th century post-Reconstruction period, where the deification of white women and the protection of white women comes out of a fear of rape by black men. And we know that this is you know, a lie. But on the other hand, I think what's important here is to say two things. Number one, Black women were never afforded these kinds of protections because they were always in peril and their children were always in peril. And their children could be sold from them at any particular time. So it's no surprise that they would want to have their children not grow up in slavery and take their own lives instead of letting their children be sold by a slave master. That's number one. But let me put a finer point on it, because you showed a picture of a plantation. I'm not sure that everybody knows where that place, plantation is. It's called Oak Alley. In Louisiana. When I visited that plantation, the reason why I recognize this picture is because it's a very arresting one. The oaks go all the way up to the plantation. You get a list of the slaves on the back porch of that plantation, and many of those slaves were mulattoes. How did they get there? It was because of rape by the white slave masters. So I think that this whole thing that Alito is uh, alluding to in this document is about two things. Number one, wanting to make sure that the white personhood of babies is preserved. That's number one. And that they will be protected. And number two, that there's going to be enough children so that if you want to cross racially adopt, you can adopt. And that doesn't matter if somebody has a baby and you're not able to get an abortion. You know, and... And listen, Mike, Michael Steele, my friend, it, it, here's the challenge. You know, if you if you go back and you read, you know, the Old Testament of the Bible or, or you know, which is the same as, you know, reading um, the Jewish Bible, the Torah, you know, there these traditions, all the Abrahamic traditions, are, they all share books. They share Abrahamic uh, storylines and characters and, and et cetera. The idea of a handmaid is in there. So, you know, when Margaret Atwood wrote this book, it, it, she didn't take it out of whole cloth. She took it from old biblical stories. And the idea that, you know, the, the, the woman who was barren, you know, this was an agrarian society, 1600 to 900 BC, where being quote unquote barren, they always ascribed it to the woman. They never ascribed it to the man until very recently, um, was horrible. It was sort of a curse from God. And so you would take your handmaid, your servant, in, in those right. cases, and then they would have the baby. This is not a consensual situation. This is a servant. I feel like trying to ground American law in that kind of not even New Testament Christianity, but Old Testament Christianity, that is a frightening start. And you don't, it doesn't end with just abortion. You now have uh, Mississippi, Tate Reeves, the governor there on State of the Union, sort of, ah, you know, we may, it may be, I'm trying to ban Plan B and IUDs. That may be next because a lot of these same evangelicals believe those things are abortive patients. Marsha Blackburn opposing the Griswold decision. That's the one about contraception. So they're saying that's also wrongly decided. You have this guy in Arizona, Blake Masters, Tucson based venture capitalist. He's Peter Thiel's guy. He says, oh no, oh yeah, we want to go further. We want to overturn Griswold. That's the plant, that's the uh, contraception one. Mitch McConnell saying, 
national ban abortion entirely possible. This is the definition, Michael, of a slippery slope, is it not? It is um, on a number of levels. And to your first point, it is it is much more difficult to reconcile this emerging uh, theocracy uh, within this, you know, uh, conservative evangelical slash political space against the New Testament uh, story, against a New Testament background, um, because it doesn't align. The, 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 the New Testament narrative is very different where the, the Christ uh, embraced everyone. So the, the prostitute, the sinner, the, the tax collector was a yes. representation of all those great sins that were condemned in the Old Testament. Um, Christ talked about the fixation of the rule and, and the order um, to, the, to the extent that it ignored the person. Uh, and that's exactly what we see now emerging in this space. Um, and as someone who is pro-life, have always had a problem with the ignoring of the human mm -hmm. person part of this. Yeah. Um, and you, you, and this idea that it's a zero-sum um, situation, particularly in the draconian laws that you're seeing now, uh, that say we won't even acknowledge. The you know the you know we want to do away with the child conceived in in we won't allow that to happen in rape or incest, um, and and so there is this this sense that um, the the party that's now trying to write this new narrative um, is is doing so and in this basis is going to be tried to be put in this sort of Old Testament space to make those folks who. Um, probably would have some problem otherwise. Feel better about where this is going.